Uh, so today we'll be talking more about inter entity relationship diagrams, talk about how they're used, what they are, uh, just go into a lot more detail than we did last class. Uh, before we do that, I want to make a couple announcements. You all got my email, right? Okay. So I went ahead and posted the article for the next discussion. That next discussion is going to be on Monday. I just made a slight little adjustment to the schedule. Um, Friday we'll just do some more examples of ERD. Uh, so I'm going to make Friday optional because I'm pretty sure that, you know, if you're feeling pretty good about the content, there's no need to have you, you know, continually just see example after example of ERD. But if you do want to see more examples, I'm certainly going to be doing that on Friday. Does that sound good to everyone? So just kind of use your own discretion. Um, you know, like I said, I appreciate the feedback you all gave me as well. Talk about that a little bit. Um, the number one thing that I uh, got was to talk slower. Uh, kind of funny you tell a southerner to talk slower, but uh, I'll certainly do my best. Um, like I said, I encourage more feedback. If you have any feedback, just let me know. Uh, if I if you you know I cover something too quickly, I get excited. You know, feel free to raise your hand and ask me to repeat it. If something doesn't make sense, feel free to you know just ask me to explain it another way or ask me to explain things a little differently. I'm always happy to do so. Um, the other thing was you all want to see more examples. Um, want to see things maybe repeated some. Um, I'll do my best. I uh, can't make any promises when, you know, part of the feedback is to talk slower. Uh, the other part is to give more examples. Um, but, you know, I will say this. Um, I'll, I'll do my best to, you know, sort of give more. And that's kind of what today is. You know, we're going to repeat the stuff with ERD. Then we're going to do examples of ERD together. And then on Friday, it'll be a lot less structured. And, you know, just kind of more examples of ERD. You got a question, Boone? No lab due Monday. I'll probably be posting a lab sometime between now and Friday. That'll be due next Monday. I want to kind of give you guys a break, you know, have the exam. Just kind of didn't want to have a big lab due. Is that fine with everyone? Like I said, there's only a total of six labs in here. So um, obviously this uh, lab four will be uh, doing an ERD. Uh, so I would encourage you to make sure you're aware of how to do an ERD before you jump into the lab. Uh, let's make sure that you're in a good spot with that. All right, let me go ahead and uh, call attendance, see who is missing. Um, anyone seen Dylan? Uh, anyone seen Shelby? Um, Brittany? Lance. Uh, Kaylee. Canaan. Uh, Nick Mohan. And Amara. All right, so just kind of review. Um, an entity is going to be the noun that describes what we're wanting to get information about. So, like I gave the example last class of a student. Let's say we're shifting gears. Let's say we're talking about a customer. Customer could be an entity. Okay, we're going to get attributes that describe the entity. So attributes are going to be each of the columns inside of a database. The entity is going to be each of the tables inside the database. Of course, instance is going to be actual occurrences of the entity. So if we had a student, uh, the student could be an actual person, or it would be an actual person. So that's going to be like a record, which is going to be like a row inside of a database. Uh, primary key is going to allow us to uniquely identify each of the different instances of the entity. So, talking in terms of a database, a primary key is going to allow us to uniquely identify each record of the table that it's in. Okay, everyone with me so far? Okay, then lastly, a foreign key is simply going to be a primary key and another table. So, primary key, let me ask you guys this, is it an attribute? Yes, a primary key is an attribute. 
a foreign key is also an attribute. An attribute is just going to be one of those different uh, columns inside of a database. Um, on top of that, something we haven't talked about yet is a composite key. Make sure you write this down. A composite key is going to be a primary key that is comprised of two or more attributes. So, for example, let's say that first and last name were not unique by themselves, but maybe no one shares the same first and last name. Now, in reality, we know they do. Uh, try to look me up sometime. You'll, you'll have a hard time finding me. Uh, why would that be? Am I the only Andrew Miller in the world? Not even close. Uh, millions of us, you know. Uh, so keep that in mind. Primary keys by themselves, they can be a composite key where they have multiple attributes. Everything we've done at this point has been using a single attribute primary key. Uh, any questions about this so far? Okay. So we also have the idea of relationships and cardinality. We went kind of quickly on these last class. A um, couple different symbols you need to know. Okay, first you have this guy. Who wants to take a guess at what this means? Zero. That's exactly correct. Our good friend Zero. Some people may call Zero their hero. Um, this guy right here. Who can take a guess what that means? One is exactly correct. Okay, now here's where it gets a little bit more, uh, well, let's, let's do this. Who, guess, who can take a guess what that means, where n is some integer? Boom. So in mathematics, that would be correct. But in this case, we're talking about n. So this is going to be where n is some integer. And we have this be either the minimum or the maximum uh, cardinality for the relationship. Okay. So we could actually put, for example, one, and this isn't really saying one. This is saying, like, nine. There's a minimum or maximum of nine. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. And then finally, we get to the idea of the crow's foot. Okay. So it kind of looks like this. And uh, the sort of formal way that we call an ERD, we often use the crow's foot notation. Okay, and that just means that the mini symbol looks sort of like a crow's foot. Okay, so this guy down here is mini. Oops. Okay, does that make sense to everyone? So, uh, Savian. The A. This right here? 1 to N? Oh, that's just a 9. So I was just using 1, uh, using 9 as an example there. Okay, any other questions? All right. So on an entity relationship diagram, we have some entity. And off of it, we have a relationship. So the entity is basically uh, represented by a rectangle. The relationships are represented by lines connecting the entities. Does that make sense? So let's just say we have two entities here. And like I say, my drawing is not perfect. Your drawing doesn't have to be perfect either. Just try to make it legible. Is that fair? So we have a relationship, and we want to express the cardinality of the relationship. So what we're going to do is the one that's further from the entity is going to be the minimum. So if we're over here, we could do the minimum cardinality, and we could do the maximum cardinality. So this is what type of relationship? Up there, which one of these does that represent? Let's back up a little bit. We know this symbol is what? Okay. We know this symbol is what? We know that the one further away from the entity is what? The minimum. We know the one closest to the entity is what? A maximum. So based on that, which one of these is that going to be? It's zero to one. Zero, minimum, one maximum. We call that zero to one. Okay. Uh, let's say we wanted to do this. What do we call this? 
one to many is absolutely correct. We have one to the minimum and many in the maximum. Um, if we wanted to get a little bit crazy, uh, we certainly can. Okay, let's say we change this guy from a 0 to 1 to a, what's that called? One and only one. That's exactly right. We got one and only one. Okay, so let's go ahead and draw all these out. And uh, I'm pretty sure that I'll be posting a, uh, a document that has these drawn out drawn by me, but you should be able to read it. I've got a PDF I'll post later today. So zero to one. It's gonna look like, and just pretend this is an entity. So one, zero. Kinda looks like a toilet, doesn't it? That's some toilet humor for you all. What's this world coming to? Zero to many. Um, so we have our many symbol, we have our zero symbol. Okay. One, only one. And you could also call this one to one. I would accept either. Okay, so this is the entity. And you have your two one symbols. All right. Uh, didn't quite think this through the amount of room I had, but that's okay. One, two, many. Like I say, you have your entity, you have your many symbol, and you have your one symbol. Make sense? Okay, let's do n to many. Okay, I'll come down here and do this one. So you have some n expressed here. Um, you could substitute that n for any integer you wanted. Um, you could do 2,000. Now, you have to have some reason you did 2,000. Is there a good reason to have 2,000 as a minimum? I can't think of any off the top of my head. Does that mean they don't exist? Of course not. Okay. And lastly, you have many to many. Okay, and this is where you're dealing between two entities. So you have one entity over here, one entity over here. Relationship between them is going to be many on both sides. And we have to address that. We'll go into more details about that. But go ahead and write down that you have to use an associative entity to address this. Okay, when you do an associative entity, what you do is you add in a third entity. So let's just come over here. You got an entity right here, an entity right here. Doesn't matter what these guys are, they have a many to many relationship. You have to address that by adding a third entity that's going to then have a relationship that looks like that, and you're going to get rid of this relationship, actually. That's called an associative entity. We'll see some examples of that. We'll apply it in more detail. But for now, any questions before we move on? Okay, here's an example of a crow's foot uh, notated ERD. So you can see right off the bat, are there any many-to-many -many relationships in this table, or this database, I mean? Any many-to-many -many relationships present? What about between student and course? Is that a many-to-many -many relationship? Doesn't matter what the minimum cardinality is. If you're looking for many-to-many, -many, you're only looking at the maximum cardinality. Who says there is? Who says there is not? Okay, who isn't sure? Okay, so for many to many, like I said, you're going to have the maximum cardinality between both of the entities. It's going to be the many. Okay, that means that one student can take many courses. Course can be taught by many students. Is that logical? Do you all have just this one course? Are you the only student in here? That's a many to many relationship. I just said we, we shouldn't have those. That's the one type of relationship we want to avoid. Um, so to address that, we would add an associative entity between student and course. And uh, I am not near tall enough to reach that, so I'm just going to sort of uh, draw it over here, if I can. 
So you have your student entity. Okay, and you have your course entity. And right now they have a many to many. Okay, one student takes many courses, course taken by many students. Does that make sense? Where did the, anyone see where the top went? Okay, and you always read these, by the way, as like section is taught by one and only one professor. Professor teaches zero to many sections. That's how you read them. Does that make sense? So professor is teaching zero to many sections. Section is taught by one and only one professor. Make sure you understand that as well. Okay, so many to many relationship between student and class. We're going to add a new associative entity. And this associative entity, let's call it registration. Okay, and make sure you understand this. This is very important. For this, the uh, primary key is going to be the composite key that has the primary keys of all of the entities that it is formed by. So right now, we're just doing an example where it's formed by two entities. We could add a third entity on here. We could have a three-way many-to-many relationship. That's possible. Just get the primary key of each of the entities that are involved. So, based off of that, what is the primary key for student? It's denoted with the asterisk. What does that say? That's right. So, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and use the notation PK. I find that a little bit easier to work with. We're also, because we know it's primary key in student, we know it's going to be a foreign key. I'm going to use the primary key notation of a FK to denote foreign keys. So, student ID. All right. That covers student. Now, what about course? What, is the, what are the primary keys for that? First of all, is that a composite primary key? What is a composite key? Yeah, so two or more attributes form the primary key. Based off of that information, does course use a composite key? It does, that's correct, because it has multiple primary keys. That acts as a single primary key, which is referred to as a composite key. Okay? What are we going to put for the registration primary key from course? Boom. That is exactly correct. So we got course name and course number. And both of these are going to be primary keys and foreign keys. Okay. So everyone clear on how I did this? Everyone clear on why I did this? The reason that you have to do this is because you cannot uniquely identify an instance of a many-to-many -many relationship. You have to have a max of no more than one on at least one side of it. So, for example, course to instructor. Course is taught by one and only one instructor. Instructor is taught by one-to-many courses. See how one of those sides has a max of one? Okay, that's an okay relationship. You can uniquely identify each of the instances of that relationship because you're not looking at something that's going to have that many-to-many -many relationship present. Okay? So, like I say, what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of this because now they don't have a direct relationship. They go through this intermediary, which we call an associative entity. Everyone have that written down. Okay, make sure you understand what this is. Make sure you understand why we use them. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and do the cardinality. Student has how many registrations? Is there a maximum number of registrations you can have? Well, you know, maybe technically, but uh, I think, you know, a lot of institutions is 18 credit hours. But, you know, we're going to keep it simple. We're just going to say many. We're not going to apply a max in the database. We're going to apply a max elsewhere. Is that okay? 
Okay? Now, if you're an active student, how many registrations must you have each semester? You can make an argument to put a one here. You could also make a reasonable argument to put a zero here because you don't have to be an active student. You know? It's really going to be determined by business rules. Make sure you understand cardinality comes from business rules. Um, you know, most of the time they're going to be logical, but this could be a one or a zero. Does that make sense to everyone? It's not coming from me. I'm not saying this is the answer. What this is coming from is the business rules. The registrar's office tells me this is the answer. Does that make sense? Okay, so if registration, now, how many registration? How many students is that going to belong to? If student ID, which is unique to every student, how many, what is the cardinality going to be from relationship to student? So we know students can't share a student ID, right? So what is the minimum going to be? One, that's exactly correct. And what's the maximum going to be? One, that's also exactly correct. Now, here's why. This trash can is really cramping my style here, being in the way. Um, so registration has student ID and the primary key. A primary key cannot be null. Okay, Null means blank. It cannot be empty. We must have it present. Um, we don't have to specify it. We can also specify not null on non-primary keys, but each primary key is understood to not be null. Does that make sense? So because of that, we know there's not going to be a minimum of zero, because if a registration instance exists, it will have a student ID present, which will be tied to a student. Ergo, the minimum cardinality is one. And because student ID is going to be one single number, we can't have multiple student IDs in here. We also know that it's going to be tied to one and only one student. Does that make sense? Because it's a primary key, it must be unique inside the table that it releases a foreign key as well. It must be unique inside the student table. Therefore, it's going to be one and only one. All right. Did I lose anyone? Everyone understands this relationship. Well, let's do registration to course. So, course can have how many registrations? What's the maximum amount of registrations that a course can have? Well, it can have more than one because there can be different instances of the registration entity that have different student ID, but the same course name and course number. That's still a unique instance. So, what's the answer going to be? So, there's going to be a mini relationship here. And must a course have at least one registration? I would say so. Now, here's a great case where we could actually use one to, you know, the n, so n to many. Do we want to set a minimum number of students inside of a section? How about six? We could do seven. We could do five. We could do ten. Um, does that make sense? We're setting some minimum number of courses. So in this case, we're having registrations that belong to a course. Is everyone with me? All right. Now, registration to course. So if course name and course num are both unique inside the course entity, they're also going to be both unique here. We can tell that because they're primary keys, and they're also denoted as foreign keys inside this registration table. What does that tell us about the relationship between registration and course? from registration to course. What's the minimum number of instances? OK. So if part of the primary key is course name and course num, we know there's a minimum of one. And because it's also part of the primary key, uh, we know there's a maximum of one because the primary key has to be unique. Does that make sense? So because it's not null, it means that we have a minimum of one. Because it is also the primary key, we know that it has a maximum of one because it must be unique. Any questions about the associative entity? Everyone feels pretty good about that. Okay. So like I say, the six is arbitrary. That's a business rule. I don't even know what the minimum number of students to take a course is here. 
Uh, I've heard of some courses that are pretty small here. Um, I know at Mississippi State you had to have no more, or no fewer rather, than six. But to get full uh, FTE, you had to have no fewer than 11. It varies by institution. I really don't know what it is here. Like I said, it's a business rule. So that's an example of an ERD. Let's go through some more of these relationships. So section, we, we did that. Section has one to many classes. Class has one and only one section. Does everyone understand how I read that? OK. Who wants to read the relationship between course and class? Boone. Uh-huh. That's exactly right. That's how you read it. OK. Uh, someone else want to read the relationship between student and seat? Savian. That's right. So uh, can two people sit in the same seat? It's probably physical, physically possible. Um, however, it might be distracting to your peers. <laughs> we won't go into details about why, but I'm sure you could put two and two together that we're having one student in one and only one seat, and a seat belongs to one and only one student. Now, does that make sense? Could you make an argument that a seat could belong to more than one person? Do you sit in that seat all day? Do people come in here before and after you and sit in that seat? Yeah, they do. So this isn't necessarily logical. Does that make sense? But if that's what the business rules state, maybe it's for a private school. Maybe in a private school, um, you stay in the same seat all day. I don't know. I didn't make this. Does that make sense? That's how you read it. All right. Any questions? Okay. Let's do some examples. We're going to do bank customers. And employees at a job. All right. And like I said, I'm going to be using some software to do this. I don't think you all could really read my handwriting that well. And plus, you know, it wouldn't show up great on the video anyway. So I'm going to be using some software. But make sure that you understand how to write them by hand. Um, I don't care what format you use, as long as it's some derivative of crow's foot. Um, you don't have to do it exactly the same way I do when you submit your answers. But let's say you don't use PK and FK like I do. Um, put a key. When you're submitting your work, make sure you put a little key at the bottom that says asterisk is primary key. Maybe you'd use like a apostrophe, like a prime symbol to represent a foreign key. I don't care how you do it. Just make sure that you define how you do it. Is that fair? Um, like I say, you definitely want to make sure that you're using the entities like that, where you have the box entity name at the top. And then primary key always goes first. You can have multiple primary keys. That's fine. But you always put the primary key directly below the entity name. Does that make sense? Um, like I said, make sure you use the relationships exactly like that. Um, pretty straightforward. You've got your 0, you got your 1, uh, you got your n symbol, and you got your mini symbol. So any questions before we start doing examples together? Everyone is clear on this. OK, that's good. All right. So. Let's go ahead and shift into, uh, like I say, I'm going to be using Visio. You can use whatever you feel comfortable. If you have access to software to do this, that's cool. If you don't have access to software to do this, pen and paper works just fine. Uh, I'm pretty sure most, if not everyone in here, has a cell phone. They can easily take a picture, upload it to Canvas. That's cool to do for your homework. Um, you know, Try to make sure it's a good picture, obviously. Um, don't take a picture of the potato. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. All right, so let's just go ahead and brainstorm what the entities may be called for bank customers. What might this first entity be called? Let's make this a lot larger so we can see it. OK. What might the first entity be called? How about customer? 
Okay, entity names, by the way, make sure you know this, they're going to be singular. Okay, so your entity names always going to be singular. You don't want to have plural entity names. I'll count off if they're plural. Um, they should always be singular. What is this font? All right, try to get a readable font. I'm not sure what's going on with this. Um, I like Times New Roman personally. So we got our customer. Let's just go ahead and get the other entities on here. And in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and change the font on all these. Um, make sure it's something legible. And I'm just going to copy this instead of trying to change the font on each individual thing. So like I said, we'll come up with the attributes later, but for now I just wanted to make sure that we have all of the different entities present. Okay, so let's go ahead and copy this. All right, so customer, we're doing bank. So what is a customer going to have? Account. Okay. So uh, we have account, and what is one really important thing for any financial institution? Let's just copy this again. Something really important. Starts with a T. Transaction, that's exactly right. Okay. So... Let's go ahead and fill in the attributes. What do you think the primary key for a customer should be? Boom. Yeah, customer ID. I think that's exactly a great thing to use. Okay. It's going to uniquely identify each customer. We can come up with it on our own. We're not using anything crazy like a social security number or anything silly. What else do we need to know about our customers? So customer first name, that's right. Probably need to know customer M name, if not at least their middle initial. Um, and it's important to note that you don't want to have something that's going to have uh, different layers to it. For example, a name. Uh, how many people in here have a middle name? Okay, who doesn't have a middle name in here? So a few people. Who has multiple middle names? Okay, so a few people. Um, so that's why I'm just saying, you know, it's good to have things as uh, sort of basic as possible. So I've got customer first name. Uh, like I said, I'm just going to copy this attribute and keep using it. So I think that's a little bit easier than trying to change the font on everything. What else do we need to know? We got customer first name, customer middle name. And in fact, I wonder if there's even a way to make this optional. So we can set it required. We're not going to do that, but. I was wondering if you could set it optional. All right, we need to know customer address, right? So we could go ahead and put in customer address if we wanted to be lazy. Um, what I'm going to do, though, is put address line one. Um, kinda... So let's do add. One, and let's just change this to add two. That'll probably be easier. That is a real bummer that it's putting them up here, isn't it? That's okay. We can move them. Keep the pain. And like I said, I'll post this at the end of class, so don't worry too much if you miss something. Or I'll post this at the end of the day, let's say that. Okay, so we've got address, uh, line one, address line two. Do we need to know the city? City is important. We need to know the state, zip code. Okay. And also another thing, you don't put spaces in between attribute names. Now, there's a reason for that. It's because whatever you're putting here 
should directly reflect the variable name inside the actual table. So when you take the ERD, you start making the table, you want this to be an exact match. Well, you can't put uh, spaces in a lot of SQL implementations for the attribute names. Does that make sense? So no spaces. What I recommend doing is using what's called camel case, where the first letter of each word is capitalized, but there's no spaces in between them. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's just go ahead and click back on here paste a few more fields because there's a couple more things we need. Okay, what else does a bank absolutely have to know about their customers? Starts with an S. Social security number. Um, you know, who's known anonymous banking anymore? Maybe you're for that, maybe you're against it. You know, this is just the reality is that current regulations, uh, Sarbanes-Oxley and others, and potentially some new regulations stipulate that there is no private banking. Um, you know, right now it's like any transaction over 10,000 is recorded. Um, trying to make it any transaction over $600 is recorded. Uh, I'm not here to give a political opinion about that, but that's reality. Does that make sense? So, what else do, must we know? Starts with yeah, date of birth. Exactly. Um, I think that's probably about all we need to know about our customers. Anyone think of anything else they'd want to include? Okay, everyone understand how I came up with all those attributes. Now, why couldn't I make address a single attribute? Why do I have to split it up address line one, address line two, city, state, zip? Why do I have to do that? You want each of your attributes to be what's called unidimensional. You don't want them to have multiple dimensions, like address, you're gonna have multiple lines, you're gonna have multiple fields. You wanna avoid that as much as possible. In fact, I could even split this up even further and have street number and then have street name and then have address line two. I could do that even further. I'm not going to, but I could. Does that make sense? Okay, so then we have account. Let's go ahead and get the attributes down for account. What time is this class in? 10 o'clock? I think it's 10 o'clock. Okay, so account. Obviously, each account has what? So it's going to have an account number. Okay, because that's how we uniquely identify each of the accounts. Ergo, that's going to be the primary key. What else does an account have? Well, let's have account type. Maybe it's checking. Maybe it's a credit card account. Maybe it's a loan account. Maybe it's a savings account. Uh, it could be a lot of different types of accounts. So we're going to express that in the account type variable, or attribute, I should say. I should use the terminology for ERD. Um, you need to know the starting balance of the account. Um, that's very important to know. Make sure you understand that. And probably would also want to know like some sort of max. And this is going to be account specific. So for example, if it's a credit card, what would that max be? your max spending limit. You've got some max amount. If it's a uh, standard checking account, what would that max be? Maybe like your max daily withdrawal. You understand I'm just calling that variable max for now, or the attribute max. But pretty much any account is going to have some max associated with it. So we can kind of leave that uh, there for the time. And then finally we have a good friend, the transaction. So I'm going to call this transaction ID. Um, and that's going to be the primary key because each transaction is going to have a unique uh, ID associated with it. It's not going to repeat. Okay, then we have account from. We need to know where the account is, uh, where the transaction is originating from. We need to know the account to. And you could call this whatever you want. Just make sure you have some way to define where it's coming from, where it's going to. Does that make sense? All right, and then there's one more thing we need. Actually, a couple more things. So a very obvious thing, uh, we have the ID of the transaction. We have where it's coming from. What do we not have yet? That's exactly right. You need to have a transaction amount. I'm just going to call it transaction AMT. 
Okay, and then finally, this is where it gets kind of important as well. You need to have a transaction time. And finally, there's one more thing we need to have. Starts with a D. Date is exactly correct. Okay? So, some of you may be thinking, where is the balance? We have a starting balance. Where is the balance of the account? Should we add a balance variable to this? I would make an argument you should not. Because what you can do is, you have the transactions, you have the starting balance, you know how much money was uh, entered and withdrawn from the account, you don't need to have a balance variable. You can calculate that. Does that make sense? Uh, because you know there's a lot of transactions that take place, it's going to be very time consuming to manually update the balance variable, even if it were automatically updated. There's still no need to do it. You could, but you leaving starting balance as well as having all the transactions is just as easy. All right. You guys ready to put some relationships between these entities? That's what I like to hear. Silence. I'm just kidding. I shouldn't be so sarcastic. Is this making sense, though? So it's a little bit difficult to put the relationships with uh, Visio. Like I said, you can tell it's being a little bit uncooperative. Um, just get it somewhere on there that you know touching the border of the entity. So up here I've got it on the top. That's okay. I would prefer it to be going from side to side, but with it being such a tall attribute, I guess they're a tall entity. I mean, that's kind of difficult. So just do it wherever it'll snap to, basically. All right. So. Right now, just the defaults that it gave us, it says customer has one and only one account. Account is held by zero to many customers. Does that make a lot of sense? What does make sense? Customer has one to many accounts. Account is held by one to many customers. Does that make a lot more sense? Okay, what's the problem with doing that though? So if customer has one to many accounts, an account is held by one to many customers, because there could be joint accounts. There could be business accounts that multiple people can access. Um, you know, if you get married, you'll probably have a joint account, good chance at least. So, you know, accounts not necessarily held by one and only one person. What type of relationship is that? So it's a many to many relationship, that's exactly right. And what do we do with that? Okay, there's uh, something we're going to do. We're going to add an associative entity between these two guys. And I'm going to move transaction over a little bit. And we're going to put, let's call it cust account. Okay, so like I say, what are we going to use for the primary keys? So we've got our uh, associative entity going between customer and account. What is the primary key of this cust account going to be? So the primary key for customer table is customer ID. The primary key for account is account num. So what is that going to look like on the cust account associative entity? So you get the primary keys from all of the entities that are involved in the associative entity. Does that make sense? So we get the primary key from customer, which is customer ID. We get the primary key from account, which is account num. These are both primary keys of customer account. What else are they of customer account? So we know they're primary keys. Are they anything else? That's exactly right. They're both foreign keys. So if I can click in here and set them as foreign keys, that is what I want to do. Okay? Because they're primary keys and they originate in these tables. Does that make sense? So ergo, they're going to be foreign keys everywhere else. Okay? So now let's go ahead and make some relationships here. And like I said, I'm just going to put this wherever I can. Okay, 
So right now this says customer account belongs to one and only one customer. I think that makes sense because customer ID belongs to one and only one customer. That's a primary key, which means it must be present, and it means that it must be unique. So one and only one. Now, what about the other way around? It says customer needs to have between zero and many customer accounts. Are they truly a customer if they don't have an account? No, they're not. So what is this other symbol going to be? That's going to be one to many. In this case, it's defined as one or more. Okay? Because to be a customer, you must have an account. If you don't have an account, you're not a customer. That's a business rule. All right. So now we have the relationship between customer and customer account. Let's go ahead and get the relationship between account and customer account. Like I said, just snap it where you can if you're using software. Um, so right now we're saying customer account is held by zero to many accounts. Well, we know that's not right, don't we? So we're going to make that one and only one. And for this other guy down here, uh, customer account, we know that a, an account can have more than one customer associated with it, but it must have at least one customer associated with it. So what is that going to be? One to many. Okay? Because multiple customers can have access to the same account. Like I said, we talked about joint accounts, we talked about business accounts. Um, there's probably other examples where you'd have a shared account. I don't know off the top of my head, but that's okay. All right. Now, finally, we've got one more relationship we've got to do between account and what? Transaction. That's exactly right. Okay. So let's just come down here, snap those two together. Now, right now, this is saying that account has one and only one transaction. Transaction belongs to zero to many accounts. That's about backwards, isn't it? You would think that an account would have, let's just say, instead of one and only one, how about zero or more? Zero to many. Okay? And then transaction has one and only one account. Okay. Because transaction has an account from one and only one and an account to one and only one. Does that make sense? All right. Are there any other questions about this? All right. We've only got about seven minutes left. Um, I don't think that's really enough time to do another ERD. Like I say, Friday's class is optional if you want to attend it. Uh, if you feel pretty confident about things, you don't have to attend it. So uh, apart from that, I will see some of you Friday. If I don't see you Friday, have a great weekend. Either way, have a great day. If you came in late, make sure that you see me before you leave.